Hey everybody. Hey Shem. Good day. Hello. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Yourself? Uh, very well, thanks, Pete. Good to speak. Good, good to speak. It's an honor. Let's see, people are dropping in. Um, it would be great if uh, the people that are already in the call uh, just maybe say hi in the chat so you know how the chat box works. Uh, there's a little chat box you can use for posting questions during the webinar. Uh, I see lots of different, seemingly different nationalities coming in, so that's great. Uh, welcome to another webinar series, this time with Sam Campion, South African photographer from Pretoria. Uh, he'll introduce himself uh, in a minute, but a few words from my side. Uh, really intrigued by his work, not only his images, but also his ethics behind his work, being really a specialist with a lots and lots and lots of miles on his radar when it comes to Africa. I mean, is there any country you haven't seen? We'll hear it in a minute. Uh, so very, very well experienced on many, many different levels from a tourism point of view, running a top-notch safari, photography safari company, as well as spending lots and lots of time in the field. It's an honor having you, Shem. Uh, just a small word of introduction from your side, and we're kicking off. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you, everybody, for signing up and joining in today. It's great to be here, and I love sharing the stories that Africa has to offer with people. And I suppose that's because I'm passionate about Africa, I'm passionate about travel, and I'm passionate about photography. So all those are storytelling elements. You know, you travel to places, you go take photographs, and from that you make a compelling narrative. And I suppose that's what kept me going, kept me looking young, but sometimes feeling old, if you like. <laughs> but, <laughs> and P, I like to think I have traveled a lot in Africa, but Africa is this funny bug that the more you travel within it, the more there is to explore. And That's I'm right. more inspired almost today than I am than I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago when I started traveling in Africa to find new places. Yesterday I came back from Gorongosa in Mozambique and I'm like totally blown away by this massively successful and positive conservation story in a small little reserve or large reserve in a country that doesn't have great conservation success stories. So yeah. it re-inspires me, it gets me going and thinking about where else there are such positive stories in Africa to share with people. Yeah. So how did that whole story start, Cham? I mean, did you grow up in the bush or did it come at a later, later stage in your life? Yeah, I grew up in the bush, if you like, in South Africa. In Africa, we use that term quite broadly. But I grew up on farms, which had a lot of bush country in it, a lot of excellent bird life. And so my natural history knowledge, along with my grandfather, who was a very keen naturalist, uh, combined at a young age. And at school, I was in the bush as much as possible. I went and studied to be a game ranger. So yeah. that was nature conservation and wildlife photography. So all those were natural elements. The camera came at a much later stage. And uh, once I got the camera, I realized, wow, this device can allow me to capture and document in a creative way the natural world that I've been following f since I was a young boy. And yeah. I, it really all started when in 2002, uh, myself and then a good friend, but then became my business partner, we had this grand idea of going on a seven-month-long trip to see the great game parks of Africa. Mm -hmm. And we saw everything we had and put everything that was left and what we owned into our Land Rover. And we drove up Africa and lived this wildlife photographer's life of just self-driving, camping, and photographing with film. So no digital distractions at all. No laptop yeah, yeah, to yeah. jump on. We'd photograph in the morning and photograph in the afternoon. And the rest of the day was like bird watching or natural uh, wildlife that we were watching. And that was a great stimulus for us to share what we saw and share what we were doing with other people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I, it's quite spectacular to look at the array of books you've been publishing in the past, uh, as well as running a safari company. Would you consider yourself more of a businessman or more of a creative in that sense, if it comes down to your passion for Africa? Yeah, it's a good question that. Because uh, I've been asked that a few times before, and, and I've, I've gone on further to study in business to help develop the business side. But I actually have, in more recent times, reconciled the answer there. And I think the, the answer to me is that I consider myself a photographer. Uh, if I pick up a video camera, we filmed a, a, um, 
we filmed a documentary last year and we sold that to a major corporation in Africa. But I'm still a, a photographer because I'm using that camera to tell stories with. And it's, um, that's where I consider myself and what I consider myself today. And every type of safari that I'm planning is based around what are the stories that can be shared? What are the experiences that could be given and had mm -hmm. on safari? For If it's for photographers, of course, it's going to be with a camera. And it could be a film camera. We've worked with film crews, and we've, and we've also worked with the individuals who really want to go out and take great photographs. So yeah. to me, I like and I love calling myself just a straightforward photographer. It sort of grounds me because <laughs> in yeah. that aspect. Yeah. Um, and if you don't mind, I'd like to share some some imagery yeah yeah of course Let's go ahead. of um of what i what i believe in if you like yeah let's just get right to it um i hope you can see that there's a lion image there is that working yeah, yeah it's working yeah. all good so, so when i first picked up a camera uh, in 2000 the year 2000 i delved into this medium and to me I was intrigued by this device that could capture a subject. And I quickly discovered there's two different ways of photographing. And this is the photography process, what I call here, where you've got a lens, you've got a camera, you've got a subject, and you've got lights. And from that, you produce a photograph. But I realized that if you apply yourself to the photograph itself, you can take the photographic process and change it completely to the creative process because we've got here we've got the same lens we've got the same camera we've got the same light and the same subject yet we've got a completely different photograph and once the, your eyes are opened up to that you realize this is a medium that is going to take you on a journey for your whole life because you're going to keep exploring different ways to capture your subjects and so the creative process takes you on this journey of exploring about contrast and light and how black and whites can work very strongly in opposition or in conjunction with each other. Uh, you can use layering, where you think you're looking at a, an elephant, the largest land mammal on Earth, but in actual fact, you've got millions of termites and flying insects in the foreground, creating these layers of depth in a photograph. You can use bright colors and dark colors so you think you're looking at a rock pile and it's pulling your eye up to the top left that white snow where in actual fact the polar bear is on the bottom right so how color can drag your eye away from the subject and in the forest of madagascar you use depth of field and wide angle and bright light to showcase a forest and when many people think they're looking at the jungle forest if you look on the right-hand branch of this picture, you'll notice that there is a subject in the image, and it's the leaf-tailed gecko, taking up almost the entire length of the actual photograph here. And so you realize that the camera is this device that allows you to create an illusion, to create this illusion of depth, color, contrast. And you also can show that scale, a subject, does not have to be large in a frame. So a subject doesn't have to be large in order to convey a strong message that you have. And so that this is where photography took me on my journey and what I wanted to share with other people. And so when it comes to creating or when it came to creating and talking about books, uh, again, I wanted to share that, but there it became a lot more conceptual. This is me having fun in the field. And also, that's what most people think that wildlife photographers actually do is just being out having fun with wildlife, yeah. but I wanted to share these little critters and how to photograph them, where to see them and what it takes to see them. And that was one of the concepts that I had. Uh, and it eventually led to a whole number of books that were published. And maybe I'll quickly share with you guys that please feel free to stop me or interrupt me with some questions as we go through this. Uh, but why books? You know, why actually go with books? And in the early 2000s, we look at this little graph here, the value of images was very high and the amount of photographs being published or produced was very low. That was simply because digital was just taking off. The Sydney Olympics had just come through and digital cameras had started being used there on a professional level. Then as we moved every 10 years, we noticed that the value of an image 
decreased, but the photos were increased considerably. And so the interest in photography increased considerably, but the value of actual selling photographs decreased. So books were a natural fit for me because there was still that interest in people actually photographs. And then there was the demand for, for interest. And photography subjects, there's more information about them than any other genre out there. Uh, if you go look on a bookshelf today in a, in a magazine store, you'll notice that there's still the photography titles are very, very strong, whereas other titles have faded away into the background. That, that market has changed so much in the last while, but photography still remains very, very strong. And the first book that we published was called A Landscape of Insects. It was a collaboration with uh, Duncan McFadgen, who was the, the author, and I was the photographer. Uh, but it all started with us thinking and having this idea of how do we convey insects in a different manner and showcase them in a different manner. And the title describes it quite nicely, A Landscape of Insects. Because field guides, typical everyday field guides, showcase species in a very representative manner and in, in brackets that actually means boring as a photographer because you've got a in this Im image here it's well exposed you've got the adult you've got the nymph you've got a black background it represents exactly for an identity point of view so you can identify it in this field exactly what you would want to in order to uh, find it in a field guide but that's precisely what we did not want we wanted to showcase these insects in their environment, in natural light, um, not in a tripod, not in a studio, or not from a tripod, not in a studio, just exactly as they were using backlighting, for example. And many of my friends said, you've got to use great depth of field, um, you've got to use tripods, and we said, no, we're going to use shallow depth of field, and we're going to create high-impact photographs, and half the image is out of focus here. It's just the, the eyes that are on, in focus. And here, even less so. So, but you emphasize in camouflage. You can see what makes this mantis camouflaged in the everyday field is these big eyes that mimic the circles of the dried flowers in the background. Mm -hmm. And so the story and the narrative grew and grew as we worked with natural light with our subject, shallow depths of field here again. But ultimately, what it turned out was, and there was a strong creative process, was we wanted to show them in the landscape. And so we started using fisheye lenses to get a very different perspective of the insects in their environment. And a fisheye allows you to get really close and, of course, go very, very wide. And so that then, again, transformed the narrative and the storytelling that we could showcase in the book. So, so Sam, if I, if, I, if, I, if I may inter interrupt you for just a brief right. minute, you, you might touch down and touch, touch down on this topic further in the presentation. But when it comes to ma making books, how much of a concept do you already draft before even shooting? Like, what is your ratio between research and field work? Just to get a bit of sense, like, is it like very much like you move with the flow? Or is it more kind of you conceptualize a whole plan and try to build that into a, a narrative that is a book? It's a, it's a, not, not a mixture of both, but your concept needs to be strong. And just like if you're going to produce a, a film or a documentary, you've got to produce a pilot. So write your first chapter of what the book would be about and th use that as an example. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what I did for the Landscape of Insects book, where I wrote the first chapter um, and then... I just drafted it in, in using words. Uh, sorry. Am I, sh I think I'm sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Let me just get see, back to see the map, a map now. Yeah. Um, let me see second. Yeah. So this book here was drafted. We were sharing a lot about what um, South Africa, photographing in South Africa, where the best places are, but it was, uh, drafted and I wrote the first chapter, which was on Itosha, essentially, and then went to the publishers with that. You forget about making it pretty. You just have a few photographs describing what you're doing and then write the content out. And the, because I'd already had the connection with Jakana, who were the publishers, in mm -hmm. order from the landscape of insects, they were receptive to, the, uh, to me. And then once you go in with a concept, 
it's then um, they were accepted and very open to the, this idea. But there is the hard work comes afterwards. This image shows the map, you know, a very short trip covering a lot of ground in order to get material because I'd highlighted yeah. some places and I hadn't been there. So you have to get out and, and actually physically go and, and get there. Uh, so there is that balance, if you like, of, uh, let me get out of here, that, that balance of getting a concept out there, producing enough content so that or con uh, from the concept so that you can sell it comfortably to the publisher that you've got. Yeah. Or you know, if you're going the sponsoring route to the sponsor and giving them that route yeah. there. So those, that's the avenue I used and it was very successful. And does that mean that you always work in a tandem kind of fashion with a writer and a photographer? It, not always. I, I authored two books, uh, but then the other others have all been collaborations. And that's the point that I, um, I mentioned here, where the authors come to me and say, hey, let's write a book, but you're the photographer. And this is a very conceptual book on trees. It did exceptionally well, sold out twice. Uh, so uh, that was really positive from the storyline. But if you look at this, these images, it's not the normal uh, tree book that you would imagine with a person in the yeah. photograph uh, showing scale, showing uh, various other elements to the to the actual trees themselves and we did include the identification part of the trees but there was a lot of concept there's lovely stories about each tree it's a very personal account yet yeah. it was also a tree yeah. book it worked it worked really nicely so um this the collaborations worked really well and because a in this instance we worked and we were out in the field and we got footage but when it comes to licensed collaborations like this image here well, this screen here, there you're using the value of your stock library. So I've got a 15-year-old library full of images. And so in these books and these examples here, I, I didn't have to go into the field again. People came to us and they said, this is the concept and the book we want to produce, and I, pro I provide all the images. So here we're seeing yeah. just images that now come out of the stock library. All these images here come out of the, my stock library. So this is yeah. when it becomes almost easy, if you like, or much easier. Yeah. It still requires a lot of work, but um, it's it's now you've got the stock, you've done the work, you've got it on a on a good system of a catalog in order for you to find those images. And what kind of numbers are we looking at? I mean, how many books do you sell usually when you publish a book? Yeah, it also it always depends on the market. So that's the the big thing in South Africa. We have a very small book market. So, and to give you an idea of what that means, what that translates to numbers, if you sell 4,000 books in South Africa, you would be considered a bestseller. Yeah. Um, and in, I don't know what that, the numbers are like in other regions of the world, but yeah. that always, to me, sounds like a small number. So typically, yeah. you want to find that balance between uh, and there's an economic curve where the, the more books you actually print, the lower the cost is per book. So Obviously. then you can sell them at a, at a certain price. So yeah. that, that's um, the balance of that and the crucible of where those, the economic curve crosses sits at around about 2,000 books that you can yeah. publish. So I think almost every print run we've done has been 2,000 books. And yeah. then if they sell out, you do another print run and so on. Yeah. So we've done yeah. multiple print runs. Yeah. But... Um, if you print more than 2,000, you might be exposing yourself too much in terms of the upfront costs. And, then and I mean, see, the as, and essentially, I, I believe uh, bookmaking is not necessarily the best way to generate income. It's more of a passion project, I believe, and like a drive to share knowledge, a drive to share stories, than it is like a prime, prime source of income. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, that's very true. Um, especially the way the world has gone technology-wise and digital interest and content consumption-wise in the last few years, very true. Yeah. The people reading books and buying books, are going. You know, the numbers are going down. There are still some markets globally that buy books. France is one of them. And yeah. that's why Rinsant Mounier produces a book every year, beautiful yeah. coffee table book, and they do yeah. fantastically well. 
those are those are anomalies these days. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so uh, to answer your point or be more specific to your point, I don't have any plans to produce more books into the future uh, currently. Um, yeah. If I did, it would be a, a coffee table style large book, more than a field guide or a sharing yeah. a sharing yeah. version of that. Yeah. So I mean, I, 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 I could I could talk yeah. another three hours with you about bookmaking. It's I mean, it's there. It's the one thing I love about photography, the photography books. But looking at the time, uh, let's jump to the second topic of our conversation, and that is hopefully a very big prime source of income for you, and that is guiding uh-huh. photography safaris. And yeah. I mean, uh, I'm making first baby steps into the world of uh, bringing gas to Africa. One of my dreams was to share these experiences with like-minded people. So I'm mm-hmm. looking with big, big uh, respect and envy at the work you've been doing with C4, your company. You founded mm-hmm. together with Andre. I mean, you just highlighted already uh, a bit of you and him in the early days. But could you tell us a bit about, I mean, it's probably a very long story, but how do you start two young boys uh, with a passion for the bush? How do you start <laughs> putting, up, putting up a company that turns into running multiple, multiple safaris a month for years on end? Uh, being successful and surviving a pandemic. Uh, I mean, just tell us a little bit about how do you do it? Yeah, it's initially it started off in a very much a uh, organic manner, but we did have some sound principles in place. And we had two points of that we really held on to and thought that this was the reason why we could provide value in South Africa and Africa. For photograph with photographic safaris, and the first was that we noticed that there were a lot of uh, safaris coming into Africa, photographic safaris, but none of them were being hosted by Africans or being run by Africans. And I, I could be slightly wrong; there might have been one or two other people. I don't want to put anybody out in, if they were doing that. But from our research, we were finding that there were many international people coming here, uh, and so we thought we would love to be able to have them use our local knowledge in order to gain access to Africa. Yeah. And then the second was, I showed that graph earlier, but how the interest of in photography was spiking when it came up, when it came to digital photography. So the interest in photography was really skyrocketing. Digital camera sales were going up. Photography had this rebirth that it hadn't seen since the box brownie. And that was the last time that digital, that photography was as popular globally and so with that, you knew that people would want to learn and people would want to understand these devices and how to actually make them work. And so we pegged our business model based on that. Is that uh, and many camera shops who were retailing ca- digital cameras also realized that digital cameras were the future. So we set about s- starting like that. And of course, in the beginning, we made a lot of mistakes and errors and you bump your head and so on, but that's uh, the the price you pay for being like one of the first guys out there. But we realized that there are people with a great desire to see Africa and to photograph it well. And so we just kept running and refining our formula and trying to work um, at giving out the best service that we can can give. Um, And it's a service-based industry it's tourism and it's logistics. And so yeah. if you can get all those three lined up, then you tend to get a good following of people. And we mentioned it earlier that it just became natural that so many of the people who came with us became great friends and are great friends of ours. And so yeah. they will travel every single year or every 18 months. And uh, you've, you've then got the responsibility to make sure that they're seeing new parts of Africa. They're still photographing at a high level and, yeah. and then and coming back with the rewards. And I, I've always believed that, that the photography element or looking after your client from a photographic point of view is like absolutely key. And if you look at many of the lodge groups within Africa, they will give you great discounts on if you utilize their lodges, over two weeks, say, if you use the same lodge group for all your safari bookings. Yet, I've always said, guys, I'm not interested in that. I'm more focused on the client side. And I'll use one lodge because it's great at that time of year for photography of one specific species. But then I'm going to go somewhere else because it's all about the client. 
And I think we've been unequivocal about that since day one, is that it's all about making sure that they're going to the right location, regardless of potential profits that you are foregoing. Yeah. It's it's focusing on the clients and I've always, you know, play the, you want to play the long game because you'd love to have your guests come back and travel again. And so that I think is paid off for us is that we make sure that they are absolutely looked after on the photographic side for their desires and for their wants that they have. And, so and I mean, the, mo the model seems to work. If I look at your website and I highly encourage people to do that, you work together with some of the leading photographers in the business, Greg Dutoid, Art Wolf, Jonathan and Angela Scott. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like some serious, it's not like, it's, it's no newbies in the industry, eh? So how does, how does that work? I mean, how do you get to, to a stage where these kind of people collaborate, are willing to collaborate with you and, you, and empower you actually to, to, to just keep growing as a company? Yeah. Hey, we all love photography. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it, it, we've you know, had some nice introductions and relations, buildings with, with um, Art and Jonathan and various other photographers and Greg that we've known for a long time. Um, and giving them the support within Africa, I think, is a major thing, is a major part, is that if they want to do trips and then giving them a strong support on the logistics side and the yeah. back office side, but also allowing them to shine and really do their part um, for trips in Africa. And so there's a lot of reciprocity that goes with it. Um, and, you know, I, I, and I don't say this lightly, it sounds like it's a joke, but we are all people who are passionate about Africa um, and who love photography. And you know, yeah. it's, it's so, so lovely having a conversation or a dinner with someone like Jonathan and Art at the same table. And, you just hear after these guys are a little bit older than us, but their desire and passion to get out and photograph and share their knowledge with other people. If, and this, this comes across at a dinner table where there's no guests involved. It's just yeah. individuals yeah. is, is very inspiring. It's yeah. a small story. I, I traveled with art once where he did a trip of Australia. And then he came to South Africa. He had been on the road for six weeks. And on the last day of that six weeks trip, just before he goes home, I said to him, Hey, we've got the day off. We were staying in Cape Town. I said, what would you like to do? And he looks at me, he says, you know, I really feel like just picking up my tripod and going out photographing. And that to me was one of the greatest lessons ever. I was like, here's a guy, he should be broken, tired. Um, hasn't been home for six weeks, and he, we went out to Bloberg and we photographed Table Mountain at, at sunset. You know, just a very peaceful. It almost becomes meditational. But his his desire was to go out and create photographs, and yeah. I was like truly inspired by that. It's just something that stuck with me. I think that was 2012, so it's like 10 years ago that, that something happened. so so simple but so powerful, eh? Correct. Yeah, you could have said, yeah. "No, let's go drink coffee." Yeah all day long and you know what people yeah. watch <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so, so um working with people who are as passionate about the, uh, what they do and how they can share it with other people yeah. has uh, i think brought us together quite strongly and that that to me has been very powerful to see and as i travel more in africa i realize that there's so much more to see and i get more inspired i mean like this goran goza story yesterday um, yeah. such a positive story that I'm like so keen to share it with people because also yeah. I'm so keen for people to see it, to see what good can come of yeah. conservation areas in Africa. Yeah, beautiful. Let's uh, look at the questions, the incoming questions. Let's not forget about them. We have, another yeah, yeah. Minutes, we have another 50 minutes, so lots of time to discuss. If you do have mm -hmm. questions for Sham, uh, don't hesitate and drop them in the inbox. First, a really nice message from Heidi from New York. I must confess that I have tears in my eyes seeing these photos and listening to the experience and opportunity of being in front of these majestic creatures and challenge oh, read more, and challenge your, yourself to be creative and give justice to the reality that is, in, that is in front of you. It makes me jealous in the best sense of the concept. I think that's essentially where it's all about. I mean, we're as photographers, I think I speak on behalf of all principal wildlife photographers. We feel very grateful for being in that position behind the lens in front of those creatures uh, telling meaningful stories about the wild. So thank you for that message, Heidi. Then a question is coming in, Shem. What is your favorite subject to photograph uh, and why? What do you think are the big, biggest challenges to conveying the messages that you want to put forward about that single subject? Jeez, that's a strong 
uh, question, and, and it ties quite nicely, I think, to the one that came in from Heidi, is that it's, it's a great, it's very fortunate that we are able to be, be, be behind a camera with these subjects, but it also comes with a great responsibility. And this is now coming to Shannon's, is that you, want, you need to do justice to the subject in front of you in order to tell their stories. And so I, I did used to have very strong ideas about what my preference for a subject is. I love photographing meerkats. I love photographing puffins because they're so charismatic. And flamingos, and these are idiots. They are animals with a, with a lot of character. Uh, but I've also realized that any subject that now I'm attracted to, I'm more focused on doing it justice. So that moment, in that moment, that animal is the most important subject to me because you feel like you've got this responsibility to do it justice. And I love uh, going wider with my shots, telling, showing images with a lot of context and a lot of, and in that context, having great compositional sense and balance in a photograph. This is speaking more to, to Shannon's specific points here. That's how I like to present an image so that when a person looks at it, there's a lot of depth in, a, in that scene and you can look at it for a long time and you can understand the elements coming together. Yeah. Um, and so I just made, I'm going to share a quick photo uh, that was on that presentation. Just pull it up quickly here. It's an image like this, which at first glance is a very nothing image. It's a, of a blister beetle, but on a flower, on a yellow flower. But you look at the tree in the background and that nest, that funny shape, that's a sociable weaver's nest. And then you realize sociable weavers are in camel thorn trees. And you look at the soil, it's red, and the flower is yellow. So this is summer in the Kalahari where insects would be out and about feeding. At, but the, the subject is this little insect, but yet the, uh, the context of, of the background, and this is, it plays a major role in telling you what, it's all, what, what your species is about. And so, See, one, 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 so one thing I want to add, I mean, I mean, it's a great little story, but if you go back to that one image, uh, Shem, for a minute, one thing yeah. I want to add to that, being a photographer myself, is that many people often assume that depth of field should always be really shallow right but mm -hmm. if you if you open up your aperture for photographers in the in the crowd here if you open up your aperture and you get more layering into an image and more contacts into the background middle ground foreground suddenly you can, you can play around exactly like shem is telling you now about the nest in the background i mean you need a certain amount of knowledge to be able to identify this connection but if you shoot more on wide open aperture, you allow yourself to create more of a multi-dimensional, multi-layer uh, uh, story in the end, right? So, I mean, you could also yeah. shoot this, you can shoot the insect in the foreground uh, on F 2.8 or even, or even, small, or even yeah. lower, but then the whole context would be gone, right? Cool. So yeah, just yeah. a little, little add on for my side. No, thank you. Yeah, a nice bit of, a nice bit of um, context there. Um, and, um, Let's go back to, um, and yeah, the biggest challenge I think is actually is actually to do a photograph justice in the in the best way. And I'm speaking back to Shannon's comment here is actually just really making sure that you do justice to the the subject you have in conveying a message because there are many yeah. narratives that you could be missing yeah. in a scene. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Shannon is responding here. Uh, thanks, Sham. So, it's subject within its environment, context is what you're going for these days. I, I'm, I've been a big fan of that. And, yeah. um, that insect book was a great turning point in my career, in that I started using wide angle lenses to a great deal um, in my photography in order to, to tell a compelling narrative uh, with the context that I've got. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, I'm not, uh, not not one niche within wildlife photography is more important or bigger or whatsoever better than, than the other. Mm -hmm. But personally, if I'm looking at the strongest wildlife imagery after curating three campaigns now and being in the field myself mm -hmm. for several years is often these images, the combination between environment and character, where you can really portray uh, an animal within its natural surroundings, kind of an environmental portrait. Right. So yes. you, you see, you do see lots of straight up portraiture as well in wildlife photography, which for my sense, I don't say it's easier, but it gives uh, less, less depth to a story. Right. And essentially, mm. I believe in wildlife photography, it should also be about ambiguity, about people finishing their own stories. 
right? About people yeah. fantasizing about what do I see and what is the context, right? So yeah, Shannon, good question and great answer, Shem. Uh, yeah, I, asking, I, 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 oh, I, I was going to add to the we get to Soka is that um, very often a portrait, a straight portrait to me, in, if you want to create an analogy to it, it's analogous to a word. And you're talking about a straight portrait now of a, a leopard in your in a full frontal. And that just means it's a word, it's an exclamation, it's, it's a shouting out. But when you are combining the circumstance and the combination and of, of uh, composition in a, in a wider scene, it becomes the sentence. And then the yeah. words start dancing out at you. And yeah. that speaks very analogous to going wide, but being very clever about your composition and, and fitting in all the elements so that there's a balance to it. And then you're telling a story. There's a sentence there rather than just a, a shout out word. That's a beautiful example. And then maybe you're leaving out a few words and those words can be added by the viewer themselves. Eh? I love the ambiguity. I love it. <laughs> no, it's all about ambiguity, man. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's, uh, let's look at Silka's question. What do you think is the best way, and it's a good question, one uh, straight to my heart. What is the best way to combine the law for photography and travel with conservation and social responsibility? So helping local people make a living and so on. Uh, yeah, great, great question. And um, if you're going to be traveling in Africa, I can speak for Africa quite with confidence. Travel with uh, operators and lodgers who you know have great ethics and have a strong have strong bona fides, a strong background and link to the communities that they're working in. Because then you know that the dollar that you're spending to stay in a, in a lodge or an accommodation place is going to the right places, is uplifting people. Um, and so that there then you can be really at peace with where you're traveling to. So there's, um, and I think COVID has taught us that there's a lot more about responsible travel and traveling responsibly. So I think that um, is a great way just to make sure that you are using and traveling with the right people in Africa. Uh, and there's some giveaway signs, but generally most of the companies are advertising and telling you about what they are doing and how, what their connections are and how strong those connections are with the, the local areas and people that they work with and the conservation communities that they are in. Yeah. So if I'm look, I mean, I've, I've been browsing your website, looking at your. Imp We've been talking about recipro reciprocity a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. and if I look at, for instance, the work you do with Wild Shot Outreach or with Conservation South Luangwa, could you explain a bit how you how you're weaving your responsibility as a tourism entrepreneur into your company uh, when doing work in Africa? Sure, sure, sure. So um, like with Wild Shots, we have two main elements that we're involved with with them. Probably three is that some of the, our employees will actually help mentor some of the Wild Shots uh, students. The, another one is that we uh, actually present every six weeks. So it's an internal thing in our company that one of the photographers that works for us, and I've done it, we present and talk and engage with the Wild Shots students. And it's done on a Zoom call, and um, so it's all live and interactive. And there's, you know, they have 15 people and we have an actual sit down session. So we provide our time in that respect. But I think the most material one is that we ha are running two workshops, one later this year and one in 2023, where uh, by people signing up on the safari, we're going to have one of the young uh, up and coming students from Wild Shots join on the safari. So the safari is sponsoring one of the most um, prospective uh, female students of Wild Shots to join the safari in order to gain experience of what a safari is about, to learn, to get global experience, and, and then be able to take her experience and mm -hmm. grow with that. And the Wild Shots outreach program has been fantastically successful. They've got uh, students that are working professionally out in the field these days. So it's gone from no photography interest at all, no wildlife connection, through to award-winning photojournalism images that are out there. And That's we amazing. love engaging with them because the level of conversation we're having on a photographic level is very high. It's, it, so when we have these conversations about photography, you're getting hammered. You, know? <laughs> you can't yeah. just think you're looking up and speaking to a, a group of school kids. It's, um, and no, no, no disparaging there. These guys are yeah. well-trained, well-educated. So yeah. my kids' program has done very well. And we... Are there to support and of course yeah. what my greatest vision is that 
Uh, we have a strong upcoming, the, the grassroots uh, of the next generation of photographers should be coming from all regions of South Africa. So yeah. if we, if we can assist there, we're more than happy to be involved. Yeah. Just to quickly, I spoke quite at length there, but uh, with Conservation South Lubangwa, we physically have donated money to helping. And we, what we love there is the dog program there, the anti-poaching yeah. dogs that they have. And so uh, every year, okay, COVID was a small problem. We would donate certain amounts of money to the dog program that they have, the anti-poaching yeah. dogs that they have there. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah. You were talking about different regions in Africa. So I'm just skipping Heidi's question for a minute, but I'll get back to that afterwards. Mm -hmm. Marion is asking, have you been to any of the AP parks? Which is a very valid question in the sense of principal wildlife, of course. I know mm -hmm. you traveled a fair bit. Uh, what, what, have you been to AP parks? And if so, uh, just tell us a little anecdote or a story about your favorite one. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, uh, because it, I've got a, a strong sense of um pain when that is mentioned i've if i think about it now i haven't actually physically been in into any of the parks of the ap parks but um i have very close associations with many and we've supported zakuma probably for about six or seven years now um, and i was slated to go in 2020 to zakuma and then in eddie and of course that all fell through so yeah. um i'm still yeah Everybody wants to go to Zakuma and even more so. It's a dream, dream, it's a dream destination, eh? <laughs> it's, a, it's a dream destination. So that was cut short because of pandemic. And just the other day, I flew over the Kafui um, and we've got a trip going in the Kafui right now. So the Kafui yeah. has just been signed up by AP, yeah. um, as you might know. Um, and I, I've been to other ones historically, uh, Matusa Donna and so on. But yeah. They will yeah. still be, they will still very much be on the radar. Never fear. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I'll just add I'm mean, one of the greatest conservation success stories over the last 20 years. Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, the support we're getting from all different directions for this campaign is mainly mm. because of the generic belief in African parks philosophy. So that is beautiful. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Heidi is asking, how would you say one can transition the, the most, the, the most important not to crack in photography, of course, how, how one can transition from enjoying to travel and take pictures to make photography the main part of your professional life. It is exactly where Heidi is now. Hmm. A very tough one, Heidi. It, <laughs> is that, um, it comes down to many aspects, but the, the two most overriding ones is one is having the confidence to take that step. And the second one is having the peace or reconciling that security of the current salary or paycheck or whatever it is that you're getting and having to put that aside and saying, okay, I'm not going to get that guarantee of income from a, your current work, but also then having the confidence to in your ability, having a, a strategy to move forward, to actually have a yeah. plan of how you're going to get work, and then having the belief and confidence to actually pull it off. It's yeah. tough. Um, I, I've been through it, and uh, it's tough in the sense that to manage all those difficult steps plus the emotional side that comes with it when you transition across. Uh, but uh, I've always noticed that once you put yourself out there, you're advertising what you do, you, and you can physically back it up with your skills that you've got. So if you're a skilled photographer, you will really, the, the word spreads and people come to you and then you start generating business. And of course, if you deliver, then it's another story completely because people yeah. will keep coming and returning back to you. Yeah, yeah. 100%. And, and if we look at uh, Prince of Wildlife, you know, the first one, nobody knew about it. It was a massive, massive step for you guys to do it. But you, did it, you had the confidence to do it. You had the skill set. And once you delivered, look where we are now. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. I mean, and it is just and not, not, not trying to be humble in any way, but it's, re it's really built in it with a very small team in little mm -hmm. i mean the room i'm sitting here now is exactly where it's built same for marion and yeah. i i hope i hope what it proves is that you don't need to be in a powerful position to be able to make a difference right and i Thank think you. that counts yeah. for every single photographer doing work in africa you don't need to be uh in a powerful position to make a difference you can make a difference already amongst your own friends your own community your own relatives and we yeah. we we just did, well this thing all blew up quite quickly and we didn't really yeah. plan for it 
but I really hope it, it, that's exactly what it shows, right? And one mm -hmm. thing to add from my side about that transition, uh, Heidi, is if you're doubting, I mean, I've been facing this, uh, this, this, all these questions as well in the past 10 years. If you're doubting whether, I mean, too many people assume it's like a, it's like a day one to day two transition. Like at one point in your life, you go for it. But in mm -hmm. reality, that is not often how it works. It's all baby steps, right? So as long yeah. as you can stick, as long as you can stick to a life that provides you sufficient income to enjoy life, then keep building step, step your dreams step by step and don't make it like a cold turkey approach. Right. Too many people make this misassumption that they jump in and then without mm -hmm. having a having a financial backup, without really having a strategy or a plan. But just embrace the fact that it's really a slow and steady process that takes years and years to build. And then essentially you, you will reap the benefits. So just em embrace the slow, the slowness of it. Right. These these days, everything needs to be fast but just embrace the slowness. So one mm -hmm. more question, and then we're going to show you the image that Shem is going to uh, donate this year to the campaign, which I'll tell you is mind-blowing. Uh, let me see. Silke is saying, thank you. I'm really keen of finding new ways to travel and photograph without fancy stuff nobody needs, but with the right people and the cool places to get striking images. I can feel that totally. But I also want that the locals benefit from tourism and don't want to want them to remain to remain poor. Well, we've been talking a bit about that. I could talk for weeks yeah. about this topic. And I also want to support conservation and preserve nature. Thank you for sharing that, Silke. Uh, last one. Thank you all. Questions from my side. I'm actually going going myself on a safari next month. This this time we'll have my 600 mil lens with me for the first time. Good for you. So quite a heavy and large lens. How do how do you travel with all your gear? Are you able to take it onto a plane? And do you trust the check-in luggage? Good question. Technical one here. I think you know the answer to that too. I take <laughs> I it, do. I it all on board and I've never ever had to uh, put my luggage under in the check-in, my, my, my camera gear. And you just be respectful. I actually got um, into trouble, not trouble, but yeah, the guy was giving me a lot of hassles yesterday for the first time in a long time. Um, at flying from Mozambique, but I managed to convince him that this is sensitive, expensive camera gear. It's going to go in the hole. It's going to go up with me, and uh, we got away with it. So I pack it in into a good, comfortable f-stop gear bag, and off you go. And so that um, if you are respectful and you explain to them in a reasonable way what you are carrying, I've never had an issue. Yeah. I mean, what also really works for me, I, I mean, in the end of the day, we're all humans, right? So if you just address these kind of issues with a good spirit and a positive, positive body attitude and a smile, I mean, what can go wrong? So what I often do is just be very open and honest, approaching uh, a check-in lady or a check-in uh, gentleman and just explain, I'm slightly worried. I got camera gear. Uh, can we please make sure I can, I can take it on, on board of the plane? And I mean, a, a, a smile and just a bit of honesty and transparency about things will get you really, really, really far. If you get one person that uh, is in a bad mood, you might end up having a problem, but that's like very, very small chances. So usually I'm just trying to radiate uh, a nice energy uh, when walking around in these airports and no matter big or small. And, uh, and to be honest, in the last 10 years, I never had a single issue. Mm. But yeah. I mean, let's, I mean yeah. and it all comes down uh, more. It's in the end of the day. It's it's also a matter of saying no to certain items of your gear on your gear list. Hey? You can bring it all. I wish I could bring fifteen lenses with me to Africa. But essentially, you ha as soon as you start saying no to a certain lens, you say yes to another one, right? Yeah. And yeah. for everybody, a different lens, different combination of lenses works uh, depending on your cre on, on on your style of photography. So accept that sometimes it's good to say no to things and it, it's really refreshing actually to go in a safari with one single lens and just stick to it yeah. and then ex ex really explore the depths of that lens and try to understand exactly how that focal length works right so looking at the time 1649 uh, european uh, summertime so that means we're already four minutes too late actually but we still have the image to reveal so i'm asking you to share the screen sham and sure, uh, yeah. show us your uh, donations for this year and maybe a little backstory. I'll show you. Yeah, thanks, P. I will show you. And it's taken in a very special place um, in Africa. And to me, it's Mana Pools. It's a place where you can spend a lot of time on foot <clears throat> with animals. And getting into a position like this is a place 
where it doesn't take you don't just walk up to an animal like this. It takes time. You you approach slowly and you let the animal be comfortable with you. And this is photographed with a 16 mil lens. But we spent almost the whole afternoon with this uh, male and a couple of others so that they were very comfortable with our presence. And most importantly, most of the time is that they were coming up to us. So we would be sitting or standing by this tree and they would be coming to us. Wow. Uh, so you're approaching in their, with their own violation. And of course, I mean, you look at this in this photograph, you go, wow, this is way too close, massively close, but we've been spending a lot of time. And that's um, just a lesson for everybody that wants to come to a place like Mana Pools is that you don't just walk up and take photographs with wildlife, especially large wildlife like this on foot. It takes a slow approach, knowledgeable guides, and a lot of experience um, to be able to eventually get into a position where you are spending time really close to these large and but magnificent animals. And that then gets you to the position where, as a sun is setting, you're in the right place and you can get this photograph. So this, this is the photograph that is being donated to Prince for Wildlife for this year. Uh, and it was uh, taken, I just looked before this to, to be 100% sure, it's a 60 mil lens, or it was mm. taken at 60 miles. So we're on foot, we've been spending a lot of time with these guys and we're really close to the subject here. And yeah, um, you know, when light and circumstance come together, magic happens. So that's what happened in this instance here. And I'm glad it's been chosen. So thank you guys for, for choosing it. Um, I hope my, it is really mind blowing image. I mean, it's such a special place. Uh, and be, seeing all the elements come together, this is like, this is not for the people that don't travel to Africa often. This is not something that happens every day. Eh? This is like a no, shot no, that no. happens once every <laughs> 10 years or once in no. your life. So, yeah, yeah absolutely mind blowing. Uh, right from the mm. start, right from seeing it, I was, uh, I was just blown away. So, uh, Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you, Sham, for telling all these uh, uh, captivating stories. I wish we could talk longer, uh, but I'm sure there will be a second opportunity along the lines. Uh, if you want to tune into next uh, live calls, keep an eye on uh, on our Instagram. We're announcing them one by one. Uh, I'm not I'm not exactly sure about how, what will, when the next one will be. I can look it up. Let me see. Uh, the next one is Tuesday, July 26. Michael Lawrence. Uh, okay. One of, Fantastic. One of our, be great, yeah. Yeah, 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 he's a great storyteller. So mm -hmm. if you're up for like a really good African story, be there. He's one of our advisory board members. And uh, I've been listening to him over and over again for the past two years. Really, really captivating uh, man, captivating voice as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Sham. Yeah. Pete, thank you very much. And thank you so much for what you do with Prince for Wildlife. It's uh, incredible to be involved. Uh, and you guys are, are doing fantastic work. And thank you to everybody here who has logged in and signed in and presented some very lovely questions. Cool, Have Doug. A good in, the, in the heat there. Yeah, oh gosh, I'm sweating. <laughs> it's, uh, the, call, the, call, the call is recorded and they will all be presented on our website so you can look at the entire uh, webinar again if you want. Uh, and we will share the link with you as well, Shem. Thanks very much. Okay, cheers. Thank you, work. Thank cheers, you. man. Yeah, See you later.